Good morning. Now, you know who the, the real patriots are that come out in this cold weather uh, for a speech this early in the morning. And so I appreciate you being here. And, and uh, for those of you that uh, came to hear a speech, I hate to disappoint you. I will not be giving a speech today. I actually quit giving speeches a few uh, months ago uh, after re really poor reviews uh, of my speeches. And I think the final one that really kind of put me over the top was I was uh, in uh, uh, a... Uh, Muleshoe, Texas, and this young woman uh, that had come with her parents uh, at a Rotary Club meeting to meet her congressman, little Sally. Uh, so I had just given what I thought was a pretty good speech. If you ever made a speech and you kind of thought, you know, I kind of nailed that one. That was, that was pretty good. And so I was kind of feeling good about it and uh, people applauded and as soon as uh, people were cl clapping, well, Sally started running across the room to, to meet her congressman. And she walked up very polite. She stuck her hand out and she said, Hi, Congressman, I'm Sally. And I said, well, Sally, it's nice to meet you. She said, Congressman, I just want you to know that's the worst speech I've ever heard. <laughs> and I kind of took back, and her mom was right behind her. And she, her mother came up. Her mother was blushing a little bit, and she ran up, and she said, Congressman, she said, I just want to apologize. She said, you know, she's at that age where she just repeats everything she hears. <laughs> So instead of giving a speech today, I thought we'd just visit a little bit. Now, when I looked at the topics of GSE's housing and the economy, when I saw what this, this uh, seminar was going to be about, I thought it was going to be a month-long seminar because those are three uh, pretty uh, big topics. Uh, and the fact that you're going to cover it uh, in, in uh, I guess, a day is uh, pretty, pretty miraculous. A little bit about my background is uh, before coming to Congress, as it was stated, I was in the real estate business, but if you, I can even take you back further than that. I was in the banking business for a while. And in fact, uh, used to originate uh, residential mortgages and, and then uh, helped the bank that I was uh, working for sell those loans uh, in the secondary market. Uh, back then, uh, you know, you, if you go back in your history books, there were things called savings and loans a long time ago. Some of you in the room will remember those. And uh, we used to sell some of those to our, our loans, to savings and loans, and we sold them to, uh, to insurance companies. And uh, so I have a little bit of background. I've, I've either sold, originated, or uh, made a lot of mortgages uh, in uh, the, my land development business. Unfortunately, it was a levered business, and every once in a while we had to, to borrow some money. So what I want to kind of talk to you about today is uh, two or three things uh, as it relates to GSEs, to, to uh, housing finance, to, to the housing market uh, and to, uh, you know, kind of what I think the state of play is. I think one of the things, the first thing we have to understand today is that Freddie and his two sisters, Fannie and Jenny, are the mortgage market today in this country. They, they, they are, are securitizing 98% uh, of the uh, uh, securitized paper in this country. HUD right now, according to HUD, about 30% of the mortgages that are being originated in this, this country are going through FHA. And so what you see today is that almost all of the mortgage activity has some taxpayer backstop attached to it today. Uh, we see a little bit of activity uh, in the private securitization market with the jumbo markets. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, and we understand that there may be another uh, deal or two that is, is pending, but most all of the activity that's going right now is going through uh, some government uh, guarantee of, of the mortgage market. Uh, the, the other thing that's in play today is that uh, we have a huge amount of government intervention and manipulation going on, whether it's the Fed, whether it's the Treasury, whether it's HUD, whether it's Congress. Uh, and we have this huge uh, backlog of, of foreclosed properties. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what my feelings are on how we begin to get rid of that log jam and how that is going to be important both to the economy and to housing in the future. And then the other issue that we'll, we'll talk about is, is the GSEs. Uh, we're at $150 billion investment into uh, Freddie and Fannie today. Uh, there are some really uh, big numbers being thrown out there that uh, at some point in time that that number could reach $363 billion. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a lot of money. And so wh what do we do? I think that when, uh, one of the number one questions, whether it's reporters or, or people back home or people in the, in, the, in the industry and academics, you know, what is Congress going to do with the GSEs? What are you going to do it, about it? And I think the first thing that I, I say is that the answer uh, is based on what we do getting a robust housing finance market back going in this country again. 
Uh, and because the solution lies in something to replace Freddie and Fannie. If you've got uh, three people that have 98% of the market share and, and you're going to wind those businesses down, you're going to have to have something that replaces uh, those entities or you're going to have to have a process. Uh, and there's a lot of ideas uh, out there about how to do that. And we have sat down with a number of different groups and all the way from totally going to a private uh, solution to people that want to have co-ops, to people that want to go ahead and just make uh, Freddie and Fannie a, 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 a nationalized uh, institution that guarantees mortgages. I mean, there's a lot of different proposals uh, on the table. Uh, and one of the things that I believe is that uh, I think we can go to a private solution. And here's the reason why. We've done it before. We've had a private solution in before. It was, as I indicated to you, in the, in the 70s and 80s, I was in the, in, the, in the mortgage banking business. We were selling a lot of loans, and they weren't going through Franny Mae. They weren't, they weren't FHA loans. They were just uh, privately originated loans. Uh, if they were over 80%, they had uh, private mortgage insurance on. Uh, we packaged those, and, we, and they were what we called conforming loans, and we made certain disclosures. And when we sold those packages of loans to, to the investors, we made representations that we had used underwriting standards that uh, at that time the standard was uh, the Fannie Mae or the Freddie Mac uh, standards. Uh, and, and so we, we had that activity. The reason that I think we have to go to a private uh, solution is we need to let the market determine the risk premium and not the government. I don't believe, quite honestly, and we've got a lot of smart people in, in government, but I don't think that, that government can set a one-size-fits-all risk premium. And the example I would give you is that there's a difference between a condo loan in Florida, in Miami, Florida, and a single-family residence in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, we have different f rules about uh, uh, foreclosure in Texas as opposed to Florida. Uh, there's different uh, dynamics to condos, to, to single family homes. A and it, so there are so many different dynamics. And when you set one risk premium for all, you have to set it uh, to cover the, the upper end of the risk spectrum. And so I believe that if you develop a private system, then the marketplace is going to determine that risk. Here's the other thing I believe. I believe at some interest rate, people will buy a residential mortgage again. Now, I think initially that rate is going to be higher than it's been in the past. But what we, have to, we can look around the world and see that other countries have gone to or have systems in place that don't have a federal or a government nexus to it. Uh, and those risk premiums uh, are, are, are narrower sometimes than the risk premiums that uh, we're placing in, in our country. Uh, the other thing that has to happen to do this is that we have to let the marketplace set the uh, uh, risk premium. And the other thing is, is we need to get back to uh, some kind of standardization uh, for transparency purposes in this country. One of the things that we got away with is that got, got away from is that we had the GSE started buying securitized uh, securities uh, that contained loans they couldn't originate themselves. They had because F Freddie and Fannie have very strict uh, guidelines on the types of loans that they can originate, underwriting standards. And but what they did is they went out and started buying loans or buying securities that had loans inside those that they couldn't have actually originated themselves or, or guaranteed themselves. And so we have to get back to that standardization where, uh, and, we, and I call it the, you know, back when I was in the, the, the banking business, it was the three C's of credit, you know, credit, capacity, uh, and collateral. Uh, and we knew, you, you, you made sure that you shored up all three of those, that the person that you were loaning that money to uh, had the capacity to pay you back, that the collateral, you were collateralized. Uh, and this person had a history of paying you back. An old banker friend of mine named Ralph Riddle has been in the banking business for, for a number of years. He was an uh, uh, owned a big portion of one of the banks in the district. He said, Randy, here's the most important lending t uh, thing that you need to know when you're loaning money. He said, Randy, people will pay you back most of the time if they can. What we got away from was making loans to people that could pay them back. Uh, and we wondered why we had a bad, out a bad outcome. Well, when you make loans to people that can't pay you back, there's probably not going to get paid back. Uh, and, and so the other thing that as we move into bringing this, 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 a, a private solution to the table 
is we have to make sure that, Jen, uh, that Freddie and Fannie uh, are not competing with the private market. Uh, and so one of the things that I think we'll have to do is, and I, I, I had a conversation with some folks out there, is we're going to have to, as we dial in a private market, we're going to have to dial back Freddie and Fannie and FHA. Because, as I said from the beginning, they have 98% of the market today. And if, if there is no incentive uh, to, for private activity because of the, the, such a small risk premium, people are going to stay with Freddie and Fannie and at FHA. One of the concerns I have uh, is that down the road is that we have to be careful through this process uh, of not making FHA the new subprime lender in this country. Uh, and, and so I believe that we, to get the private solution going on, it's going to require a tremendous amount of transparency. It's going to have to, everybody's going to have to know what they were buying. One of the problems with, with, with the, the bust that we had is people were buying product. They really didn't know what was inside those, those packages of loans that they were buying. Uh, and so now if you have a go back to the standard uh, where people know what uh, the uh, FICA score is, uh, know what the average loan to value ratio uh, is in that, what the types of these are single family loans, what, what states they're from, what uh, knowing a huge amount of disclosure uh, I believe that there will be a market for those securities. And what people are going to have to do is know what they're doing. And so if you are buying a standardized, uh, a conforming loan securitized transaction, you know what's inside that. Now, some people say, uh, uh, subscribe to the only kinds of loans that should be securitized or these uh, gold-plated uh, loans that are to, to a conforming uh, underwriting. Uh, I don't know that we need to, as a government, need to determine that. But what we do need to make sure is that we put the cigarette label on those that aren't. And that is warning, these, this, this package of loans, these loans do not, are non-conforming. Uh, they are underwritten to these standards. And so that people know that. What, what I think uh, that also allows us to do is if you don't allow some uh, flexibility in the marketplace, you, you are going to default all of what would be the lower quality loans uh, to FHA. And I'm not sure that that's the best interest. And I think there are provisions. I mean, when I was making mortgage loans a number of years ago, we had people that uh, w w would make good credits. Uh, and we, we knew the, those people, and, but for some of their ratios might not have fit inside the guidelines. And we made those loans, and we called them our non-conforming loans because they didn't conform to our traditional standards. Uh, I still think that we, need to, that we can make a place in the marketplace for that, but I think that we need to make sure that everybody understands that when, they're, when, when those loans don't get mixed in uh, to other packages for, for transparency purposes. So how do we start dialing uh, this process? How do we get to the market? Well, I think one of the things that we have to do is look at the portfolio limits uh, or the lending limits uh, for the to GSEs and, and, and Fannie Mae and start bringing those down gradually. Because what we know right now is we have some activity uh, in the uh, uh, jumbo market. Uh, and the jumbo market used to, to go down a lot further than it does today, but when we rose, raised the lending limits, then we, then we pushed, pushed that up. I think we'd been to, to, to dial that back uh, to those limits and let that, that uh, market come back. And one thing we know about the jumbo market right now, it's a very high quality market. Uh, and so I, I think initially what you're going to see, the appetite in the private sector is extremely high quality paper. And so that's going to cause people that are originating to start looking at how they're going to package uh, their loans to meet what the market requirements are for the investors that are ultimately going to purchase these loans out in the private sector. The other thing is, is I think we're going to have to do with uh, Freddie and Fannie and, and, and FHA, we're going to have to increase their guarantee fees. I think they are below market right now, and obviously they must have been because you've got a, a couple of entities that are, that are under, underwater, and so obviously they weren't uh, covering, carrying enough uh, uh, guarantee uh, fee into the, their business model to, to cover losses. And so I think as we bring those up, so then what, what begins to happen then is I think we're going to hopefully bring some parity uh, to 
you know, if I'm an investor out there and I'm looking for uh, good investments and I like mortgages, then I can have mortgages that were originated uh, privately and have no federal backing. I'm going to get this yield. Or if, I'm, if, if I want to look at then what is the yield that I can get for loans that are guaranteed or have some federal nexus, it's a lower yield. And I think once, once what you'll find is that the, the marketplace will finally price what that risk premium should be. Uh, and when it gets to the point where, and particularly I think in this environment where we've got relatively low interest rates, people are going to be looking for return. And so are they willing to give up 25, 50, 75, 100 basis points, whatever, it, whatever the number is, uh, to get a little bit more return and, and, and give up uh, the federal, federal backing. Uh, the other thing that needs to happen within the, the GSCs is I think, you know, in, in, in their portfolio management. One, they shouldn't be, all of the origination that, that the GSCs ought to be making right now ought to be slam dunk loans. Uh, we shouldn't be increasing the taxpayer's exposure any more uh, than they already are. Uh, and so uh, the, the, the underwriting needs to be extremely tight, uh, good quality. Uh, and the other thing is, is then what we need to be thinking about, particularly, and you're going to probably address this a little bit, is in housing and the economy, is in what to begin to do uh, with this huge portfolio of, of, of real estate that, that they're, they're acquiring here in the foreclosure process how they're managing their portfolios. Uh, wh one of the things that I'm gonna say in a minute, and I'll go ahead and kind of get uh, uh, on the table here, is I think that all of these foreclosure mitigation uh, initiatives that we're taking need to stop. Uh, one of the things I learned very quickly is that markets aren't kind, but they're very efficient. And what we have done to this market is we have tried to sedate it uh, for uh, months and months and months here, uh, thinking that somehow the pain will go away. Well, what we know is all you do when you give somebody painkiller is you're numbing the pain, but the pain is there. There is pain to be had out in this marketplace. Uh, and I, I think uh, HAMP and, and some of these other uh, initiatives, I think the things, some of the things that, uh, uh, that uh, the Fed is trying to do, uh, I'm not a big quantitative easing uh, fan, uh, and uh, I think some of the, the foreclosure mitigation and, and all of this administration pressure to uh, trying to pressure financial institutions into uh, doing things that may not be in the best interest of the market. Uh, the thing that does most for housing is demand. And as long as you have all of this supply out there, you're, you're, there's more supply than there is demand. And there's a lot of money sitting out there uh, on the sidelines that is ready to come in and start buying this property. Now the prices will be lower. But for, from a homeowner's perspective, if, we, if we're really trying to protect those people that are in their homes, they're making their payments, the sooner we can get that inventory into the economy, the sooner I believe long term that housing prices begin to stabilize uh, in this country. And that's not a popular thing. They say, well, Randy, you're being insensitive, but what about all those people that they're gonna lose their homes? You know. What I know is that there was people that were put in their homes that probably should have never been there before. And we can talk about whose fault that was, but the bottom line is we have folks that are in homes or got into homes or got into real estate uh, ownership that didn't belong there to begin with. Uh, and so if as long as you keep that property there, uh, then the neighborhoods are, uh, are continue to deteriorate because what we know is those people aren't taking care of those. The other issue, uh, is a lot of, a lot of uh, front page headlines here about the condition that states and local governments are in. Well, what will really help states and local governments is if we start to clean up uh, this housing inventory market and let these values bottom out and then start to come back. They're not going to come back as long as uh, we have this huge amount of, of inventory out there that nobody knows what to do with it. They're not being, they're not being cared for. Uh, and so we continue to see, and a lot of these people, if they're not making their mortgage payment, probably not paying their taxes either. Uh, so it's a compounding impact that, um, and so, so the solutions are, so far, let's get a robust housing finance market up and going in this country. Let's build it uh, based on the government, not uh, guaranteeing people's mortgages. 
let's get the, the things going on at Freddie and Fannie uh, in a sense where they're not competing uh, with uh, the, uh, the private market, uh, that we're letting the mar private market set the risk premiums, uh, and that we begin to move in a direction of dialing those uh, entities back, making sure that they're being managed appropriately uh, and that the credit quality is, is, is good and that we have a, a long-term plan of how we're going to begin to liquidate their portfolio assets, uh, what to do with their contingent liabilities. But what, you, what, you, uh, what is imperative is, is we've got to get started because right now they are, the, the origination levels, they're getting all of the business. And so that contingent liability uh, it, it bills every day as they begin to guarantee and securitize uh, new residential mortgages every day. So the, every day that we let go by means that contingent liability uh, stays, uh, continues. The third piece of it is, what is the role of the government here? Now I already started down this role, uh, road, and that is we gotta get to get the government out of the way here. Uh, and uh, as one, we gotta you know, let the market do what it needs to do with, with foreclosed properties. But the other thing is that we got to also address housing policy in this country. Because we've been trying to do housing policy through, in many ways, through these GSEs. And that, that was a bad model, we already know that doesn't work. Uh, and then the other piece of it is, is housing policy in, in the future, what does it look like? Uh, is it explicit? Is it implicit? Uh, you know, and, and what, is, what is the real cost? Uh, I believe that you have to have housing policy, and I'm not going to go down that road today because that's a, we could have, that's, a, that's another seminar. Uh, but, but I do believe that we have to know that uh, what it's going to cost the American taxpayers. Uh, and that it ought to be one that doesn't have a lot of ongoing liability to the taxpayers. In other words, the taxpayers say, okay, this year is how much I'm willing to spend on, on, on housing policy. The way we do house, housing policy today, we don't know what it's going to cost because it's done in a, such a way that uh, uh, there's a contingent liability down the road uh, and we don't know what the, the, that, that number is. And quite honestly, it's that kind of leveraging and that kind of thinking that got us all to where we are today where we're having to have uh, a, a role like this. The, um, uh, Again, I think the federal government can have a role of, of, of a regulatory structure of making sure that uh, the new housing finance market has some oversight so that someone is saying that uh, these, these securities are being put together with residential mortgages that meet the criteria. Uh, and so I think if someone said, what is the federal role here? I think the, the regulatory role is one, making sure that the entities that are securitizing the entities that are making these representations are in fact doing their homework, their due diligence, uh, so that there is a certain amount of certainty in the marketplace that when you're buying these securities that you have, that, that, that brings that, uh, that transparency and certainty to the market. Uh, and of course the housing market is going to play a major role in this. What will be the demand uh, for mortgages? What will be, what does housing look like down the, the future? Uh, you know, I'm not an economist. I'm just an old home builder, land developer from Lubbock, Texas. Uh, but what I do know is that what th the market looks like going forward depends on a couple of things. One, the housing finance system that we can put together. And then what does that do to the number of people that can actually qualify to uh, take a residential mortgage? What we did uh, is we built a huge uh, amount of demand based on uh, selling uh, homes and financing homes to people that actually couldn't afford those homes. And so what does the world begin to look like in a deleveraging process, uh, which we need to let happen in this country at every level, government, companies, individuals. When we delever, and we get back to what people can actually afford, you know, how many cars, what kind of car, what kind of house, what kind of furniture, what kind of, how, what kind of trips, what kind of vacations can we take when we're not leveraging uh, equities in, 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 in our homes? Uh, I think it's a different world. And I think one of the things that s the sooner we can prescribe and let the rest of the, the market in the world know what housing policy is going to be, what mortgage finance looks like, then I have great confidence uh, in the markets to adapt a housing structure, housing inventory, housing product uh, to what the rules are gonna be because they did it just recently. 
Uh, they said, gosh, if we can put people in bigger houses with lower income, we'll build bigger houses. Well, maybe now the new model looks like, you know, whoops, that maybe they couldn't afford houses that size. And, and so maybe houses get smaller. Uh, so I, I think, but until we bring that certainty to the marketplace uh, across the spectrum of regulatory, financing, uh, housing policy, uh, all of those things, I think it is difficult for housing to get a firm hold on where it's going. And uh, we've got to do something about the, the inventory piece of it uh, because I think that's a, uh, a huge piece of it. And, and I would close before uh, I go to Q&A here. And, and you know, the, 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 the solutions for housing and the GSEs are complicated, and, you know, and they're, and they're not necessarily easy. Now, they will require, in my estimation, more dependence on markets and less reliance on the government. But I believe long term, a robust housing finance market emerges that where the where it relies on market discipline and not taxpayer subsidies will result in a more stable and sustainable market down the road. It should, our, our housing policy should be in this country sustainability. Uh, and if we do it sustainability, then what we'll ensure is that in the future, uh, that housing will return to be a positive for American families and not necessarily a negative for our American families. Now, I, I understand I have a little time for Q&A here, and I want to kind of let, let you know uh, how I feel about that. Is, uh, you know, Einstein had, had, a, had a chauffeur that it was kind of his butler, his chauffeur, and he traveled with him everywhere he went, uh, and uh, even kind of looked like him. And, and, and one day, the, the chauffeur was taking Einstein to a speech. And he said, you know, I've heard so many of your speeches. He said, I think I could give that and nobody would ever know the difference. So Einstein thought about that a minute and said, that's a good idea. So they switched uh, wardrobes, and Einstein was sitting out in the audience, and the chauffeur got up and gave one of the best speeches. And, actually started taking a few questions and was able to answer them. And then finally, uh, one of the uh, people in the, from academia in the audience that was pretty much a renowned uh, in uh, nuclear and all of that, that kind of stuff, got up and asked this very detailed molecular structural question. And Einstein, the chauffeur, looked out into the audience and said, you know what? He said, I'm surprised you'd ask such a simple question like that. He said, even my chauffeur knows the answer to that question. <laughs> so I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to take the easy questions, but if you ask a really hard one, I'm going to let one of my associates ask the answer. But I'd love to take a, a question or two here. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for your time and your comments. Uh, I do some originations locally, and my personal feeling is that if the, if the conforming loan amounts are lowered from the 729 and what is a high cost area for this area, that the meager originations we get now will grind to a halt. Are you not concerned about that happening if you succeed in lowering the uh, upper loan amounts for the conforming money? Thank yeah, you. And, and that question comes up. And, and so the, then really what your question is, is when is the best time to start this process? And there's nobody ever thinks there's a good time for change, but everybody thinks there needs to be a change. And so the question begins to arise is, do we go ahead and begin to let the marketplace know what the rules are going to look like moving forward? Or do we kind of limp along here and then maybe let the market start to recover a little bit and then come in and try to change uh, the rules? I believe, and this is just Randy Nagelbauer's opinion, I believe that we establish the, 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 the principles and the rules now and let the market build on the new rules rather than waiting until we get into the middle of, of, of some kind of a housing recovery here and change the rules again and then possibly cause the marketplace to uh, go down some. Uh, and so what I think uh, we do, and when we talk about lowering those loan limits, I think we have to, to do that in a laddered way where everybody knows out front what, what, those, what the, 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 the drawdown schedule is going to look like. Uh, but what we do know is in, 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 in some areas uh, of the country, a $750,000 loan would be a jumbo loan. Now, here in Washington, D.C., it's almost a first-time homebuyer loan. But, 
Uh, but but sh so we know people are have been uh, securitizing and originating those kind of loans. I believe with quality credits that they'll do that again. Hi, thank you, Merrill Smith, Independent. Um, two major government interferences in the housing market have not been addressed, and they're not directly related, to, uh, admittedly, to the GSEs, but I have to ask anyway. Uh, the mortgage interest dedu deduction for taxes, uh, would you consider either restraining it, if not eliminating it altogether in some tax reform package, for example? Secondly, and this is a state laws, uh, uh, bankruptcy laws in many states, including, I believe, Texas, and uh, although I'm not sure you can correct me on that, and Florida, for example, have no limits. So you can have a mansion and have it immune and sheltered from bankruptcy, which seems to me to encourage uh, perhaps excessive building and excessive prices. Both of those policies seem to put the government's thumb on the scale upwards uh, for uh, housing prices, perhaps unnecessarily. Yeah, in Texas we have a homestead exemption, and I'm, I'm not sure if I know exactly what, what that amount is. But I think that's, again, reason that the government shouldn't be setting the risk premium, uh, because the risk premium shouldn't be the same for everybody. Because, for example, some states allow you to walk away from your mortgage. Some states don't allow you to walk away from your mortgage. And to me, that's a, there's a risk premium that should be priced for that. Uh, the bankruptcy law in, in a particular, uh, you know, how, how that, if there's a difference in a state by state basis, ought to be a price in the risk premium. So if I'm buying mortgages, you know, I want to, those are, that's information I want to know. And I want to know if I know that about the, the 50 states, then I'm going to be selecting mortgages uh, in the portfolio that I want to buy that addresses that, that risk premium. Uh, and I think what'll happen quite honestly, is rather than the federal government having to mandate that, if the marketplace starts to put a higher risk premium, say on a Florida loan or a Nevada loan or a California loan, than say an Oklahoma or a Texas loan, then this, there's gonna be pressure on the state legislature. You know what, I think we need to fix our, our laws here so that our, our residents aren't paying a different uh, mortgage price. Now letting the marketplace, that's the reason I think is whatever we do, uh, we need to let the marketplace determine these risk premiums and not the federal government because I only have to point to you to, to, to uh, the flood insurance program to let you know how well the federal government, uh, it's underwater and no pun intended. Yeah. Um, um, Matthew R R Richardson. So I'm very sympathetic to the, uh, the private uh, solution. One um, concern is that we have a lot of other government guarantees throughout the system. So the uh, potential danger might be that we go from public GSEs to private GSEs. So uh, what's your thinking on that and how can the, the thing well, that's structure? Well, that's the reason I mentioned that whatever you do with the GSEs, you're also going to have to look at your policy at FHA as well. Uh, and uh, VA, FHA, all of those, those kind of things. And, and, and make sure that we're not driving, because I think uh, the statistic I showed you is 30% of the loans today are FHA loans. So, I mean, that's one third of the market. I mean, they were down in, 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 the, in the low teens before, uh, and now they're, they've come back up. One of the things I was extremely concerned about, we wrote to Mr. DeMarco a letter, was this plan that was, came out over the, over the holidays where they were thinking about Freddie and Fannie taking a bunch of you know, principal write downs and moving those loans over to uh, FHA. We don't need to make FHA the subprime lender for, for the country. And so I think some of those, and it was kind of interesting in Dodd-Frank, for example, we kind of exempted this qualified residential market uh, mortgage uh, requirement f on FHA. Uh, and so I think we're almost defaulting trying to make them a subprime lender. I don't think that is good housing policy. Um, I just had a question about political commitment uh, moving forward. Let's say we privatize everything as you suggested, and I, I agree with the, with the premise there. Um, my question is, let's say in 30 years, the market misbehaves and we have a big crisis, large defaults and so on. What's the commitment that the political process will not take those private entities into conservatorship then? Boy, that's a good question, and I'm probably not going to be around when that's hopefully, uh, but, but that's a good question. But what I, what I, what reason I believe that long term the private solution uh, is it will really take a lot of the artificial manipulation that's going on, had been going on with government trying to do more and more housing policy through these 
these through the mortgage market and other things. And so I'm, I'm hoping that, that it, takes, it takes some of the, the uh, market discipline uh, in place every day on every decision is prevents that from happening again. But what we do know is housing is going to cycle, economies are going to cycle. I don't know, we're not gonna prevent another downturn. Uh, but what we have done is we've built a market based on the government not stepping up to that. One of the things that, and this is kind of my, my closing, because uh, my guy over here is standing up, that must mean I'm about to change those cases. But one of the things that I think uh, is, uh, is so, in, I've been emphatic about this. When we brought all of this government intervention into the marketplace here, to quote, to ease the pain, I said it was going to be a very rocky divorce, I mean marriage. But what's going to be even rockier is the divorce as, as we try to withdraw the, the government intervention in all of these areas out of a marketplace and get the market back uh, going again. Because, and this is just exactly what we all knew was going to happen, the market's gotten comfortable with government being in the room. The only problem is, is the government being in the room, I think, distorts the markets. So as we withdraw the, the, the government from the markets and from the room, the divorce is going to be rocky, but long term, the relationship is going to be better. Thank you. God bless you and God bless the United States of America.